breakfast or dinner or evening service. I'd like to welcome everybody else, everybody back out tonight. Nice to visit with us. We're especially happy to have you with us this evening. We'll begin with number 338. Lord, we come before thee now. In first, second, last, first. Mm -hmm. Using a book, you can mark number 706. We use that as a song of encouragement the following lesson this evening. Number 706. Song before the lesson will be number 587. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus. Number 587. In first, second, and last verse. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him out.
The Bible speaks a lot about those who steal in the Bible, tell them that don't steal anymore and get, go to work and, and things like that. And, and often the Bible will call them robbers. The Bible will call them thieves. Either how you look at it, it's wrong for what they do. And we know that it's wrong. None of us like somebody who comes about and steals from us and takes away things that we have. Well, even Christ on one occasion made reference to being a robber because of how they came to arrest him on that Thursday evening. In Matthew 26 and verse 55, it says, In that hour Jesus said to the multitudes, Have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I sat daily with you, teaching in the temple, and you did not seize me. So here he just comes to reason with them. Why have you come take me like this? Did you think I was some kind of hardened criminal, some kind of individual that may go about and, you know, begin to retaliate and start killing folks myself? And he says, you know who I am. In the temple I was there, daily I was there. You know everything about me. And yet you come with at me with these clubs and with these swords and such. And he talks about uh, them there, what an overkill this was, what they're trying to do. Well, when it comes to the, the word thief or, or robber, the Bible speaks of four individuals that were very close to the crucifixion when it comes to being a thief or being a robber. Now, two of them we know very well, but the other two, we may not have realized just how close they were to the crucifixion, what they, part they played in this, but the four we're going to look at tonight and and how each one can, we can learn something from their life. Take, for example, there's the one thief that we're familiar with probably the most. And that's the thief that repented. The one that turned to Christ on the cross that day and there asked to be with him when he comes into paradise. In Luke 23, 42, then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, for surely I say to you, Today you will be with me in paradise. Now this thief is the more popular thief at the crucifixion. We know that there was no one on the other side of Christ. But here's the one that repented. Here's the one that people like to talk about. The one that had to change of heart. The one that realized that i got to do something here. I realize I'm fixing to die. I realize there's life after death. And he did something about it. He recognized that he was going to be dead by the time the sun went down. That's going to be assured. And whatever time he talked to Christ here, I don't know how many hours were left, but he knew that my time is very short on this earth. He also knew that he was guilty. He was guilty of everything that he had, he had done in his life as far as being a, a criminal. He knew that he deserved to be there, but he also knew that Christ was innocent. He knew that. He had a fear of God. And yet, here he makes the greatest decision he'd ever make in his life. To make sure that he, Christ would remember him when he came into his kingdom. And if we are a Christian, if you are a Christian, then you can relate to this man's decision. Because you understand that death is a reality. It's going to happen. It's going to take place. We don't know when, but... It certainly it's going to take place once the Lord returns first. You also understand that your soul is going to live on in eternity, even though your body will be dead and go back to the dirt from which it came. We know our soul will live on. We understand that the sinfulness that we were living was wrong, and we repented of that. We're doing our best to do better. We had a fear of God, knowing that one day we're going to stand before God. And yes, it too, just like this man here, this thief, it was the greatest decision that we've ever made. It certainly is. The decision that will carry us into heaven. Again, what a great decision this man made, this thief who repented, and what a great decision it is when one makes it even today. When they call on the Lord and there they become Christians, baptized there into Christ. So here we find the first thief that we're familiar with, the one that repented. Now, on the other side, there was another thief, and he was the one who rebelled. We see that in Luke 23, 39. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. 
At one time, both of these thieves were saying this. But the one we just looked at, the one who repented, he stopped. He realized his condition. But this particular thief here, he never stopped. He kept saying this because in the Greek language, we get to the word there, uh, saying, that means it was a progression. He kept saying it and saying it and saying it. I don't know how many times he said it, but he constantly was saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself in us. If you are the Christ, save yourself in us. He kept saying that over and over and over, and yet he had the same opportunities that the other thief had and to save in himself, but he simply would not make the most of that opportunity. He would not turn to Christ and make that request of him to remember me also when you come into your kingdom. He simply would not do that. Why wouldn't he do it? It's hard to understand. Here is a man on his deathbed, you might say. He's going to be dead in a few hours, and yet he would not turn to Christ. Sometimes people will say things like, well, there's no atheists in foxholes, you know, and when it comes right down to it, people will change, have a different view of God. Oh, well, not necessarily. Here's a man right here who knew he was going to die, and yet he would not change one right there, just a few feet of him that could change his life, but he wouldn't do it. Why wouldn't he do it? It may be because he had too much pride, the wrong kind of pride. I'm tough. I'm a man. I'm not going to admit my error. I was justified in what I did. People just don't understand my life, my situation. He probably had the wrong kind of pride. Proverbs 16, 18 there, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before fall. Well, here's a man right here. He had the pride, and it wasn't very long till he was destroyed. He had a great fall as well. So it could have been that he had pride that, would, that we just wouldn't allow him. I'm not going to admit that I'm wrong in this. Or there's a certainty of death. Maybe he thought, well, somehow, some way, somebody else is going to come and, and maybe rescue me. Maybe he had some friends that were plotting this and he got word of it and they were going to rush that hill and they were going to take out those soldiers and, and take him off that cross and, and carry him away from there. That may be what he was thinking. We don't know. But he, didn't think, he probably didn't think he was going to die. It may be that he was thinking, just any moment now, I'm going to get a piece of paper with my pardon on it. I've been working with my lawyer, and he said it's a good possibility. And so he may have been thinking here at the last moment, somebody would come up that hill, the sheet of paper, his lawyer. But that lawyer, if so, never showed up. He may have been thinking that. But yet he should have realized that Hebrews 9, 27, is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. He should have realized that he was going to die. He would not see the sun rise on the next day. He was going to be dead. But yet, some way, probably he was thinking, well, not him. He would be the exception. Also, he may fail to understand just what sin was all about, how sin will, con will condemn a person. His sins, they weren't that bad. He knows some other thieves that were, had done some things a lot worse. And he began to compare himself and justify for what he was doing. But his sin, no, not my sin will condemn Romans 6, 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Sin is sin. No matter how small it may be from this thief's standpoint, it might have just been a toothpick that he stole. Well, that's wrong. Or he take it all the way up, maybe stole some things. He might have stole somebody's life and taken somebody's life. Again, sin condemns, and he probably failed to realize that. The importance of the soul. Maybe he didn't understand that totally, that his soul was going to live on. Mark 8, and verse 37 there, as it says, uh, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Well, he's about to exchange his soul for, for something. It's not going to be good what he's going to receive, but it didn't have to be that way. At 3 o'clock that afternoon, when Christ breathed his last, his opportunities were over. He was going to die in a lost condition, and he failed to realize just how important his soul would be. And then this man may not have had a, a fear of God. No fear of God. And I've met a few people that way, and you may have as well. They just don't fear God. Or well, they may believe in God, but they think they're going to pull God down on their level. 
I got a few questions I'm going to ask God. And on judgment day, I'm going to get him by the collar and bring him down to my level, and I'm going to let him have it. Really? You really think that's the way it's going to work? When you stand before the almighty God who created all things, you think that's the way it's going to work? That may be what this man thought. Please ask these 12 in verse 13, fear God and, and keep his commandments. We've got to have a fear of God, a respect to God, and knowing that it's, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Fearful thing. Well, this man didn't have a fear, not a fear of God. All these things here, pride, uncertainty of death, sin, the importance of the soul and the fear of God, if we have these, any of these, all of these, well, then we could lose you know, our soul as well. Because again, it cost this man his, and it very easily could cost us ours. So the second thief there that we find that we're familiar with is the one who he did not repent. He would not repent whatsoever. He was a man that rebelled, the thief who rebelled. Now the third thief that we're familiar with, we don't always look at him as being a thief, will be that of Judas. He was a thief. And John 12, when the lady came in and, and put the very expensive oil or perfume on Christ, and, and it was uh, here Judas that said, we need to take that perfume, that oil, and we need to sell it. And we need to take that money and help the poor. That was his thoughts. Not a bad thought, but yet that wasn't what he really was about. In John 12 and verse 6, this he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box and he used to take what was put in it. <clears throat> so here he is. Now let's do something good with this money. All along, he was out there thinking in his mind, here's what I'm going to spend it on. Here's what I'm going to do with it. Hard to believe that he would do that. Because here he was, he was hand-chosen, hand-picked by Christ. Here he was, he was one of those that, that went out, when the, when the disciples went out two by two, teaching the Word of God. Probably one of those that, I'm sure he did miracles. The apostles are here, or disciples at this point, they had the ability to do that, limited miracles, you'd say. And here he is, he's doing all that. And what happened that caused him to change into a thief? Something changed about his life. And that what changed is, is, is probably his love of money. Here he is, at this point, wanting to take money out of the treasury, something he'd been entrusted with. And it's not long from here that he betrays Christ for some pocket change, just 30 pieces of silver. How could he do that? Because he had a love for money. 1 Timothy 6.10, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. For such some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. That was Judas' problem. That was his downfall. He had a love for of money. He was willing to do anything for it. He was willing to lie about it. He was willing to steal. He was even willing to portray the very Son of God to get his hands on that money. Did it cause him many sorrows? Well, yes, it did. Went out and hung himself. But at the same time, where's his life right now? Where's his soul right now? The Bible says he went to its own place. Loss is what happened. Was it worth it, Judas? Was it worth it to be a thief? Not now, it's not. If he could, he would give every dime of that back that he took out of the treasury. He would make sure those 30 pieces of silver were never taken in the first place if he could go back and redo, but he couldn't. So here's the third thief. And sometimes we don't realize how close he was to the cross. He was right there as well, one of the followers of Christ. And then we come to the fourth thief. And here's the thief who was replaced. And we know him as Barabbas. John 18, 39. Here's what Pilate says to the people. But you have a custom that I should release someone to you at the Passover. Do you therefore want me to release to you the king of the Jews? And they all cried out again saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. 
Hard to believe how they could do that. How just a few days earlier, they were welcoming Christ into Jerusalem. They were cutting the palm leaves and putting them down on the, on the road he was traveling, putting their clothing out there, welcome him to the, to the great city there, and now they're hollering, yelling for his death. Again, and here's Barabbas, a robber, a man that's going to have his place taken by Christ. Again, it's just their custom. Once a year they would do that. But here he is replacing a man who taught truth, replacing a man who performed miracles, replacing a man who had never done not one thing wrong. And he was going to take Barabbas' place. I wonder how many of those individuals that were out in that crowd that day that were yelling, crucify him, were yelling to give us Barabbas. How many of those did Christ maybe help in some miraculous way? Maybe they had a sick child, maybe a sick uh, husband or wife or other family member, maybe themselves, and, and Christ helped them. I wonder how many were in that group that were yelling this. Christ took the place of Barabbas. He should have been on that cross. He should have been the one suffering. He should have been the one that had his legs broke as well. But Christ took his place. We don't know anything about what happened to Barabbas after this. We don't know if maybe he began to think about it. Did he change his way? Or did he keep on about his old ways? Probably when he just kept on his old ways. He probably thought, man, what a lucky man I am. How fortunate I am for him, to the people, to love me so much and want to take the life of this man. Did he know anything about Christ, I wonder? The thing about it is, Christ took our place. We should have been in the place of Barabbas. We should be the ones that are being punished by, the, by, the, by God. That should be us because we have sinned. We have done things that, that are just go against the Scriptures in so many ways. And yet Christ said, I will take your place. He went to the cross, and there he died for us. And as Romans 5 and verse 8 says, but God demonstrated his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He died for us while we were still sinners. Not after we said, yeah, well, I'll repent, I'll change. You do what you need to do, Christ. You know I'll do my part. No, he did it. We didn't say anything. He did it for us in hopes that we would change, that we would repent, that we would have a change in life. He died for us while we were yet sinners. He didn't have to, but he took our place, just like he took Barabbas' place. So there we have four thieves that were very close when it comes to the, to the cross, that are surrounding the cross, being at the cross. One, he did all right. One, he did what any repentant person would want to do, being in that situation, ask for forgiveness, and that Christ granted it to him. We don't, be, we, we don't want to be like the other three because the other three didn't turn out so well. Tonight, as we extend our invitation, if you're not a Christian, you need to become that Christian. Christ did what he did for all of us. And how terrible it would be for one to go into all eternity thinking, you know, I could have had it. I could have been saved. I, don't, I didn't have to be in this, in this torment that I'm in. I wonder how many times the thief, the other thief, the one that passed up the salvation, how many times does he wish I could go back to that cross and hang there beside the Son of God? I would certainly do things different. I figure he thinks about it a lot, knowing that. If you're not a Christian, well, not tonight. I know you believe. Why well, not repent of your sins? Confess the great name of Christ to show you're not ashamed of him and be baptized in the Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and then begin living a faithful life to him. Or as a Christian, you can say, I just need prayers. I need to, I need to re-evaluate evaluate my life and realize I need to be on a better road. More thankful for what Christ has done for me and live for him every day. If that needs us there this evening, do the right thing. Become that Christian or be restored as we stand and sing our song.